Hello everyone, this is Tom Fox and I would like to welcome you to episode 201 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. The FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report is sponsored by Advanced Compliance Solutions, your one-stop shop for all products and services FCPA compliance related. Today I conclude my three-part interview series with Maurice Gilbert on hiring in compliance. Maurice is the Managing Director of Concilium Executive Search one of the country's top executive search firms, and certainly one of the very top around chief compliance officers and compliance practitioners. In this episode, Maurice talks about the interview process and the offer process. He explains explains how he prepares candidates for the interview process and what you should expect uh, when you receive an offer and a counteroffer. The episode is a little bit long, comes in at just over 38 minutes. I hope you enjoy it. Thank you very much. This episode of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. In this episode, I continue my conversation with Maurice Gilbert, the CEO of Concilium Executive Search. We are reviewing the hiring process. Uh, for chief compliance officers and other executives in the C-suite from A to Z. We have uh, reviewed what where it starts with the company and what the company needs to do to get ready to consider bringing someone on. We've talked about how uh, Concilium and Maurice consider the sourcing of candidates and presentation of potential offers to candidates, how uh, he goes through that internal process. And we are now to the point where candidates are going to visit with companies. And having worked with uh, Maurice, uh, he is very diligent in explaining how important the interview process is. So we're going to devote some amount of time to the interview process for anyone out there considering uh, moving a position or uh, any uh, potential or future moves. This is going to be a very important and very useful episode. So with that, Maurice, uh, welcome back, and uh, thanks again for taking the time to uh, visit with me and my audience. My my pleasure, Tom. It's a pleasure being with you and, and sharing this uh, with, with your audience as well. So let's get right into it, Maurice, the interview process. Uh, I have had the, the privilege of, of working with you and been prepped by you, and I will say without a doubt it was the most thorough interview prep I've ever gone through any time ever, period, and that includes going through uh, being in, uh, having a master's in human uh, resources uh, from Michigan State University. So uh, let's get right into it. You've got a, a very uh, useful way for candidates to think through the interview process. Uh, you've given us uh, four steps, so, so let's just hop right into it. What do you tell candidates and why do you tell it? Okay. Well, first off, uh, there are a few components before we actually jump into how we prep a a candidate, we also have to prep the client, by the way. (laughs) Okay. And and then the other component, so we have three components basically. We prep the candidate, we prep the client hiring authority who's conducting the interview, and then during the process of two, three, however many interviews, We also are constantly debriefing both the candidate and the client to see if we're still on track. Now, having said that, let me jump into your question of our methodology in in prepping the candidate. So, firstly, no surprise here, uh, we, we emphasize that there is a direct correlation between preparing and how well one performs, whether it's an interview or any other business meeting. When you and I attend a business meeting, we prepare for that meeting. And the same applies here in an interview process. Uh, people who think they could wing it are sadly mistaken. Uh, you can't perform your best if, if you're not prepared and if you don't have a methodology. So researching the company, that that's quite easy enough. Um, 
the companies we tend to represent are public companies, and there's just a plethora of information information overload as far as products, services, et cetera, et cetera. So that's perhaps the, the easier part and most accessible. What we also encourage, though, and, and we start prepping our candidate, we tell them something that I referenced to you in a previous module, as much as 80% of the hiring decision is based on soft skills. In other words, connecting. So for us, it's all about connecting, connecting, connecting with your audience because we've already made a determination that the candidate is qualified in our interview process with the candidate. So we already know that they're qualified technically. So at this point, it's all about connecting with the interviewer and the colleagues of the interviewer. So can, one of the can I just stop you right there because you, you really bet. hit on a, an important skill. We talked about that in the last episode, and that's really the soft skill side of, of uh, chief compliance officer, compliance practitioner, or indeed any C-suite executives. And here you're bringing that forward to demonstrate the importance of it in the uh, interview process and the, actually the right. preparation for the interview process. So mm -hmm. I just want everyone to understand that uh, it is really much more than technical competence throughout this process. And and you're, I think we're able to, going to be able to talk about how your soft skills will lead you to uh, your career progression as well, but that's really a, a, an important connection, um, pardon the pun, for uh, the listeners to make throughout this series, which is the soft skills and how they're used in each step of the process. So. Uh, that's correct. And, and also bear in mind, at this point, we have already made a determination that the professional that we're representing has the requisite soft skills. We've already determined that. So What's it all about? Well, again, it's all about connecting. And here we have a distinct methodology that we counsel our, our candidates. And here goes. Number one, always, always, always research the individuals that you will interview with. It builds a, a quicker connection. Here's what I mean by illustration. We had a professional that was interviewing for, <clears throat> she was interviewing with the chief compliance officer to be a senior director. And we said, okay, you have to research the individual and find something that may help build a very quick and solid connection. So she researched and found that the chief compliance officer had done a presentation at a compliance association. She read it, and the first thing she said when they got together was, I read your presentation on such and such. Very powerful stuff because of this factor. Number one, the chief compliance officer is extrapolating, wow, this person is prepared, the person is inquisitive. And then there's the other component, which is more subtle, she was flattered. So this helped build a very quick and solid connection as they talk about this presentation for a few minutes, and then they segue into the interview. That technique is powerful. Another technique that we recommend is this to, to the candidate. Ask very early in the interview process some question that defines what the interviewer is looking for. That could be done in, in a few different ways. It could be. What would you like me to accomplish within the first year if you are to hire me? Or, and there are several ways of doing it, another way that, that could be uh, productive is 
could you tell me three or four of the most significant criteria you'll utilize to evaluate me for the opportunity? However you ask the question, and those are some examples, what it does is it draws out from the interviewer precisely what they want. It paints, in other words, a bullseye, and then it provides the candidate an opportunity to relate specific experiences that they have directed toward what the interviewer wants. So what that, in, what that concept does, that technique, it allows both parties to stay very on target. Without it, the conversation could drift. So it provides some structure and discipline to the, to the interview process, and it facilitates the candidate driving home his or her expertise and how it relates to what uh, ultimately the hiring authority wants to see in that individual. Again, it's all about connecting. And then there's a third concept that we really like to emphasize when we're preparing candidates to interview. And you know, you know we work with high profile professionals and I don't care how smart people are and what they've done, most people tend to talk about themselves like I'm responsible for this and I'm responsible for that. Well, that's all well and good, but very, very incomplete. Because at the end of the day, the hiring authority wants to know how are you going to help me? How are you going to bring value to my environment? Well, you have to spoon feed that information. And that would be conducted or implemented, I should say, by what we call value proposition statements. Did ABC that resulted in fill in the blank? That is a very powerful way of communicating and it's a, it's, it's a way of communicating that we're, we're never taught in law school or, or anywhere. So it, it's a real differentiator. And again, the concept here is you're providing that interviewer precisely what he or she wants to know. How have you created value in your prior environments because if you can create value there, you could create that value in my environment. So those are, are very basic uh, concepts and techniques that we implore our professionals to utilize within the interview process because, again, at the end of the day, it's all about connecting, connecting, connecting. Make sense? It, it makes sense. Uh, another concept I've heard you talk about is, uh, and, and this may sound counterintuitive, so I want you to, to give your full thoughts on it, which is due diligence back from the candidate to the client. Oh, uh, yeah. Well, clearly, if I'm the professional interviewing the candidate, I have two roles. Number one, to demonstrate that I'm the value proposition and you ought to hire me. That's one objective. The other objective, of course, is to do my due diligence, and that's where uh, we encourage to not only um, create a list of questions, but, but actually write them down so that you know, you don't have to struggle to remember. So, again, we're very deliberate in how we approach the entire process here. So what we encourage uh, professionals to do is uh, put their questions in buckets, which would include questions about the company, questions about the opportunity, questions about the management style of the hiring authority, questions about the culture of the company in general. So 
again, this is entirely up to the candidate to tunnel in and do his or her own due diligence beyond what you could navigate in research. Now, if I could turn to a concept that I really like that you put out there, because it encompasses kind of points one and two, the connection and the due diligence back to the client, because you've always said it's about presenting a compelling story. So what do you mean by a compelling story? Well, it does help if you illustrate specifically, if you're not talking in generalities, in other words. So what that story would look like, you know, it may be challenging for me to ad lib here, but you want, you could add a real life illustration of something that you've done, in other words, versus just outlining something. Because I don't know quite how to categorize this dynamic, but we like to hear stories. It kind of resonates and creates a personal connection. So that's the type of thing I'm talking about. It's where you're putting a little more meat on the bones, so to speak, for your audience. Well, I guess the way I thought about it, certainly in the context of your points on developing connections and then the due diligence back is, those are two steps which lead you to being able to present a compelling story, because you've made that interpersonal connection. You have researched the client so that you understand a little bit more about what their needs are, and you can kind of package that all together in this story that, you know, why you should hire me, why I'm the best, in a way that's not just saying, hire me, hire me, hire me, I'm the best, I'm the best, I'm the best. You presented really, as you say, a compelling story about why this particular candidate might be one that should be given significant consideration. Absolutely. That's the end game, because it's a very competitive landscape. Bear in mind, we're typically presenting five professionals for our client to thoroughly vet. And in our mind, it's all about who's going to connect better. I'll tell you an anecdotal story. If I'm at a social event and people ask me what I do for a living, and I say, well, I'm an executive recruiter, oftentimes I've gotten a question that sounds like this. At what point do you know who your client will hire? It's a very interesting question. And I'll say, I'll know as the interview process keeps on progressing. And what I mean by that is because I am debriefing the candidate and the client after each touch point, I'll be able to piece together from that data who is probably implementing the techniques that we suggest, because those techniques are building a more profound connection with the hiring authority. And when we look back and see who gets hired, who gets the opportunity, it's typically, again, the one who's made a more profound connection with their audience. So actually, we had an individual in your community in Houston, and this individual is kind of like the poster child of connecting. We had three finalists, and this particular individual, he had the least amount of years of appropriate experience than the other two. He had a basic threshold of technical proficiency, but of the other three, of the other two, that is, he had the least amount in years of untargeted experience. Well, he got the job because he did a better job at connecting. 
And one of the things he did when he researched the individuals he was going to talk to, he found one individual that they went to the same law school. He found another individual that they worked at the same company, albeit at different points in time. But the point is he found a, a, a profound connector with each individual, which again just illustrates my point. At this juncture, when we're presenting four or five top-notch professionals, all of which can do the job, now it's a, a function of who's going to articulate that, who's going to make that connection with the hiring authority. Now let me go back to something you started with because this is also something I found very interesting in your approach, which is the constant debriefing. And I originally thought that that was a, a communication that occurred between you and the candidate, but you really expanded that to both the client and you and then you and the candidate. Could you go over again the constant debriefing in the context of now someone has gone through the interview process and why uh, would they need uh, debriefing at this point for uh, to lead to kind of the next step of a, a, a go no go decision on an offer? Well, it, it's very important, especially well fr from both sides. But l let's let's start. Well, let's say with the client. No matter how competent a, a professional is, a client will always say, I like this, this, and this, but I'm concerned about X. Well, the problem is sometimes the client, well, oftentimes the client will tell us this data, but, but they won't articulate it to the candidate in real time. And in other words, they won't give the candidate an opportunity to possibly address that. So when we debrief the client, if they say, well, I'm concerned about X, then we take that data and we share it with the candidate. And we say, look, when you go back for your next round, this was of, uh, of concern. And figure out a way to bring that into the equation and address that concern. So that, that's where that type of um, debriefing is significant from, let's say, the client perspective. Um, and again, also this applies to, to the candidate because the candidate is, is going to share information uh, with us that that they may not sometimes be comfortable in sharing with with the client or maybe they just forgot so if if I'm a candidate and my primary interest is capturing more um, international exposure if if the client did not thoroughly address that in, in let's say the first round of interviewing, then I go back to the client and I say, look, you, you didn't do quite an adequate job of articulating how this position is going to have tremendous exposure internationally, maybe in, in the Russia or China markets. So you need to, you know, you know, put some more color to that in the next round of interviewing if you want to continue to capture the imagination of this particular candidate. Okay. I think now I'd like to turn, if we could, to the final phase, or at least perhaps the next step is the better phrase, yeah. the offer. So how does the client um, prepare to make the offer, and then what do you, what's your role in, in communicating that, and what does the candidate do when they receive the offer? Sure. Um, when the client identifies we would like to hire X, 
the conversation that we have with with the client is okay we've we've already presented to you the minimum expectations uh, economically of of the professional so that's part of the front end of the introduction of, of each professional so because at the front end the, the the both parties have to have reason to believe that if they get to the altar they could get married so to speak so at at this point our client says okay we'd like to make an offer to X what do we need to do so I I review with them the dynamics of you know what we had presented earlier and I encourage the client to come right out of the box with their absolute best economic proposal why do I do that well because of supply and demand demand is very high supply of, of great compliance officers is very low this is not where you you know we're not at a Persian market here and we we put something out there and see if it's gonna fly you know uh, we have to make our we're not in other words <clears throat> poorly articulated there's not a lot of back and forth negotiation for weeks on end like some people might think it's typically more straightforward again partly because of our influence here where we tell our client put together your absolute best offer initially and typically our clients will do just that so they'll prepare an offer we'll look at it we'll give um, our client an opinion and then we say okay that looks reasonable then we take it back verbally to the candidate we get the candidates buy-in comments concerns whatever and if it's a go then we have the client prepare a, a formal offer letter that's usually how it shakes out um, rarely is there a tremendous back and forth um, there are some situations where um, you're just massaging the components but the total the total package is is what both parties are expecting if that makes sense it does let me ask you about uh, something that I don't really think has come up uh, yet in our series which is uh, the word you in concilium do on reference checks how does that to the process and uh, how do you guys go about reference checks uh, reference checking is very important we have the ability to do an extensive reference check this is not casual it's and it's not done with former HR uh, well P, uh, HR people at a former employer because they will not give a reference check um, they will only state yes I could verify that the person worked here from this period to this period what we do in reference checking is much more exhaustive and professional We're, we actually interview professionals that the candidate has worked with as a peer and some references um, are supervisors and this is a detailed um, questionnaire that we walk through with the person being a reference and we're talking about technical skills presentation skills leadership skills character <clears throat> now typically there's no surprises because this has all been vetted in, in in our screening process and we know these people perhaps we've known these professionals for five who knows maybe even as ten years but nonetheless uh, our clients 
like to get this this data and uh, we could spend easily 45 minutes in interviewing a reference to, to get these data points. But again, typically it's just an affirmation of, of what we've already come to expect. So you've done your reference checks, you counsel the client on making the best offer, they put a, a offer together. Is the offer communicated uh, verbally to you and then you down to the client, or do, does uh, a client put together a formal written offer letter? How does that part of it yeah. work? Well, again, uh, we, can, we have a conversation with the client. Again, the client says, okay, I want to hire this candidate. And we say, okay, let's, let's make sure we're on the same page. And we kick around of the economics. And when we're comfortable, we present a verbal to the candidate. And if the candidate is fine with the verbal, then they prepare a formal offer letter. And basically, we're done. Um, but there is another component here. I don't know if you'll get to this in your line of questioning. This is very important. and. It is oftentimes overlooked. It's the resignation of the professional. And this could be very tricky if it's not handled well. So what I mean by that is every professional that we represent, they are the best of the best. So what does that mean? Well, they look to tender resignation, and what that means is they're going to get a counter offer from their existing employer. So we actually spend easily 30 minutes just counseling the individual on what to expect and how to address the counter offer. It could be a very, very uncomfortable. Um, by that, what I mean is I've seen companies go so far as to try and make the individual feel guilty, like how <laughs> could you do this to me, you know? Uh, so it's, you know, it's and, – and the professional could be quite vulnerable emotionally. What do I mean by that? Well, here's what I mean. Even though the professional is excited about moving on and they're moving on for reasons that, that have been constantly reinforced throughout the three or four, five-month process, even though they're moving on and they're gravitating to something which is usually a, a, a great promotional opportunity, usually um, – they're still angst about doing something new. So, so the professional is, is feeling maybe a little bit anxious or uncomfortable, even though there's joy in what they're pursuing. Okay? So if I am an employer and I'm not terribly professional about – accepting and being gracious about accepting the res resignation, you know, I could try and play on that string. How could you do this to me? Or, or a myriad of other things um, that could make a professional very, very uncomfortable. But we counsel people on this, and we have to tell them <clears> – <throat> We have to counsel them. Now, remember, you're going to get a, co uh, a counter offer. Not maybe. You are. But you have to stay focused. What do I mean by that? Well, you have to stay focused on why are you about to or, or why did you accept the offer of our client? Well, you accepted the offer because it affords you a promotion. Now, your present employer 
is not going to do that. If they were going to promote you, they'd promote you. Does that make sense? It so the, the, makes the, a lot best of they, the best they could do is throw a little more money your way. Big deal. If they if they throw a little more money your way, that doesn't um, address the issue of why you wanted to leave in the first place. So that's how we keep our, our professional on target and focused because the, the, their existing employer is not in a position to address that issue. If they, if they were in a position to address the shortcoming, they would have already done it. That's the point I'm I'm trying to make here. Right. So with that in mind, you know, and and then we we actually do counsel the the professional again, you're somewhat emotionally raw a, at this point. And and just recognize it that you may be a little bit uncomfortable until you know, you start your new job, but it, it's like anything else in our lives. You know, when we get married, uh, when we have a child, these are glorious moments that we we want, but it still provokes anxiety because it's new to us. And that's where we, again, we have to counsel the professional so they they don't to uh, make a, a wrong decision based upon being emotionally vulnerable. I've seen this happen only once, by the way, where a professional accepted a counter offer, and of course what happened was uh, then he was fired within six months afterwards. <laughs> because you know from a client perspective they're only buying time okay? right so you know because their perspective is look you've already demonstrated to me you're unloyal right so thank you for accepting our counter which in effect just gives us by just time to find your replacement <laughs> so it, that that's a no win uh, scenario but it does again tendering resignation could be very anxious time for 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 anybody. I've experienced it even myself personally. So, uh, but that's a really important concept to help people navigate through. Well, Maurice, unfortunately, we're at the end of our time. Uh, you have given us just a incredible wealth of information over the past uh, couple of pod three podcasts. And I was wondering if uh, anyone, either a, a candidate or a company client type, wanted to get some more information. Uh, where are you located? What information is available on the website, or how might they get in touch with you? Oh, sure. Well, uh, as you know, we we have our website at uh, www.concilium.com. And then my personal uh, address is Maurice, M-A-U-R-I-C-E, at concilium.com. And our number, our office number is 972-934-8444. Well, Maurice, I really want to thank you uh, for uh, doing this. I've wanted to do this, as you know, for some time. You've put a lot of great information out there. And I look forward to continuing the conversation. Thanks, Tom. You ask great questions, and, and I'm happy to, as always, to visit with you and share our knowledge with, with you and your audience. Thanks a Thanks. lot.
This is Tom Fox. I'd like to thank you for listening to episode 201 of the FCPA Compliance and Ethics Report. If you enjoyed this episode with uh, Maurice Gilbert, uh, you should check out my uh, blog post, which uh, have much more detail about these uh, issues. I look forward to visiting with you again. Thank you very much for listening. This is Tom Fox. If you have any questions, you can reach me at tfox at tfoxlaw.com. Thank you. Thank you.